Hello everyone, welcome to our fourth session on the Monitoring and Evaluation Panel. Session, learning from real life. <clears throat> we all know that life as experienced can be a lot messier than it looks on paper, often including circumstances that are not ideal or people that don't behave the way they're supposed to. In this session, the panel presenters give us their insights into energy efficiency evaluation in real life. Richard, over to you, please. Sorry, I beg your pardon. <laughs> I should introduce Richard first. Richard Bull is a Deputy Dean of the School of Architecture, Design and the Built Environment at Nottingham Trent University. A recurring theme of his research is the need to move beyond feedback to explore innovative participatory methods of engagement in order to enhance environmental citizenship. Now, please, over to Richard's presentation. Thank you. So, welcome to this presentation. My name is Richard Bull. I'm Deputy Dean of the School of Architecture, Design and Built Environment at Nottingham Trent University and I've got my co-authors Ashley and Andrew who are still based at De Montfort University which is where I was for many years and where most of the work in these projects was done. That's where I was based for a long time and where really the body of work that um, the three of us have been involved in over the last few years were done and we've got a lot of experience now built up around these projects and we felt it'd be really interesting just to take a step back and reflect on these three projects and to think about some of what we've learned and how we might interpret and reflect on that. Um, the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, actually, I was thinking about, um, we're going to talk about three projects. I don't think we can take it too literally in terms of thinking about which project is which, but um, any excuse to have a picture of uh, the man with no name there, uh, Clint, uh, who really, for many people, epitomises, I guess, that hero character, which we we'll maybe hear a little bit more about when we think about what we mean by storytelling. So um, I won't dwell on this slide. I've used this a lot over the last few years when I've presented at ECEEE, um, obviously normally in person and in the sun. I do have my shorts on, by the way, this morning. It's very nice here in Nottingham this morning when I'm recording this. But really just the overall challenge that we face around non-domestic buildings, their carbon footprint and the challenges around uh, behaviour change and energy efficiency within those spaces. What's been interesting to reflect on that is um, think about storytelling as a way of um, looking at our projects and reflecting on the activities that we've done. Um, Katie Jander and her colleague Tapuz have written a bit on this. They presented, I think, at ECEEE a few years ago around this, as well as there being a special issue in the Energy Research and Social Science journal paper. So it's starting to uh, become a bit of an interesting area and in a way, I guess, starting to reflect more on a uh, personal capacity in terms of how we understand these projects. Um, what we understand by success, what are the stories that we're telling each other when we come and present, and it's particularly pertinent, isn't it, when we come and present a conference like this and we have 15 minutes to, to tell sort of uh, the success of what we've done. We've uh, secured some funding, we've done a research project, we've made an, uh, there's been an intervention, Particularly, I saw this when I went out to AC Tripoli a couple of years ago, where very much the approach is, um, we've did this intervention, here's the energy saving and here's the financial saving, and that's why it's worth doing it. And almost if there wasn't that saving or that benefit, you wouldn't bother to present it, because what would be the point? It wasn't a success. Um, so there's that reflection we'll come to in a second on hero stories. But again, I think it's also worth reflecting on this myth of objectivity. Um, in just brief preparations for this, majority of work that is done around energy and buildings adopts a positivist, positivist approach as opposed to a more constructivist or postmodernist approach or personal approach. And we could have a very interesting conversation uh, if we were in person and in EAIR around the different methodologies and understanding of knowledge here. But um, I'm very drawn to this idea that who we are really affects what we do and what we study. And there's always an element of bias and reflexivity in 
what we choose to tell and what we choose to leave out and how we're presenting ourselves and the work that we do. Um, and this is where we come to then the hero story where um, gender and taboos have really started to reflect on this idea that, again, in these stories, we tend to over exaggerate um, the savings, the success of these projects, uh, how they've impacted people and maybe how they've impacted us as well. And that's what I want to sort of tap into a little bit this morning. So um, we're not talking when we refer to storytelling here about simply telling fictional stories, although I think actually uh, fictional storytelling would still have a, a place in terms of uh, learning and behaviour change. We may want to think about that. But here we're contrasting the idea of the hero story, the exaggerated um, someone coming in, fixing, solving the problem, getting the big uh, energy efficiency savings, as opposed to actually maybe telling a learning story where we acknowledge the specific context, location and people involved in order to present maybe a more accurate and realistic picture of the real world. And I'm just going to give you a very quick whistle stop tour over some of the work that I've been involved in and just maybe tell you a few things that maybe didn't go so well and maybe some things that did go so well. Um, so three projects, there, there's more over the last 10 years we've been involved in, probably close to 10 UK university based and EU research projects. Um, three particularly jump out, and this is what I reflect on. All three, um, as you'll see when I quickly go through, I'll have the, the journal paper there. They've all been published um, in peer review journals and in ECEEE presentations here. We've talked about all of them here. eTeacher is being talked about uh, this week as well by my colleague Andrew Reeves. Uh, so that you can get the detail on the projects. In other, in other places, and I'm not going to spend too much time reflecting on this, but you can see the headlines there. One was a um, Leicester City Council based project, Good Deeds, uh, Digital Economy uh, project. And then we were leading that at DMU. And then we have SAVES, which was the, one of the last sort of uh, Intelligent Energy Europe projects uh, that then had a follow on project, SAVES 2, that is just finishing at the moment, I think. And then we have eTeacher, again, a large EU consortium that is just finishing this summer. All um, involved with producing apps of some kind, all involving public engagement um, in some kind as well to try and get that participatory. Uh, climbing the ladder of participation is a phrase that we've come across a lot. So very quickly, the first project, Good Deeds, uh, trying to build this app that you can see here and you can see the journal publication there. We'd had a really good relationship with Leicester City Council through the university and so we partnered with them on this project. Uh, they were very positive in the uh, from the outset in terms of what they think it could deliver. Um, but we had a few snags fairly early on actually. Um, one was as we started to work and form the public engagement groups and we were deliberately gathering the experts, so the energy manager, uh, we wanted to get the facilities manager there because there was that subcontracted rollout to managing the buildings, as well as just getting the ordinary building use. So this was something that was really, I saw as a real opportunity to start breaking down the barriers in the organisations and to see, um, to get the actual building users talking to the experts and sharing that knowledge about how they're actually experiencing the building working. What we found though, first of all, is we started to form the groups and you can imagine it was challenging getting people in a busy work environment to get them to come out to for energy. Is um, This was 2013, there was the big crash and um, in the UK, financial uh, challenges, big cuts in local authorities and Leicester City Council, like many of the local authorities, were having to make people redundant. So suddenly, having had the initial enthusiasm about getting people out to talk about energy and um, sort of carbon savings and climate change in buildings, suddenly it was the last thing on people's minds as people worried about their jobs, understandably. So there was a challenge there straight away. And then we hoped to get um, the facilities managers involved, but we were told by one of the members of the energy services team, actually relationships weren't great and they felt it would be too difficult to do that. And so we were told we couldn't contact some key people. And then when we actually designed the 
app, which was fairly rudimentary looking back at it at the time. We anticipated using social media to really get that um, sort of collaboration online. And we were told that the, the local authority was too nervous about putting sort of that conversation about energy into their social media space because they were worried about it. So we again, we were told we weren't able to do certain things. And what also was interesting, and I reflect on this at the end a bit more in terms of the nature of these projects, is that we'd, you know, the nature of doing these design projects is you have to spell out what you want to do up front. But actually, as we started to do the public engagement, we realised that actually the public engagement side was the interesting bit, and the app really wasn't needed at this time. But because it was a digital economy project, we didn't have much choice. We had to push on with implementing seven that we knew wouldn't necessarily write because of the obligation to the funders. Let me just skip forward then to saves. Again, completely different kind of project in many ways, large European project, very strong project management. It built on, and this I would view this as a successful project all around actually, both in terms of the energy savings that it generated, but in terms of the way it did it and the implementations. But there were some challenges along the way, um, but it was built on um, already an existing National Union of Students, uh, Student Switch Off campaign. And really this was rolling it out uh, to Europe where previously it just been in the UK. And they wanted to bring an app so they could see the live energy savings as the students were having their competitions in halls of residence. Um, on the whole, it went really well, but we did have significant personnel challenges in the in my team. One of our members um, had quite a significant health diagnosis along the way, and also uh, a significant time was lost due to uh, falling off a bike in California. Um, actually, as we were out at AC Tripoli presenting some initial findings, and we did encounter some challenges. As we were starting to do something quite um, significant, we wanted to take energy data across universities uh, from all across Europe. And again, there were challenges and delays that meant that we didn't move as quick as we could along the way. But we did get there in the end, actually, and this is you know, I look back very positively on this project. Finally, and I won't say too much about this because this is a live project at the moment and it's happening. But again, it's led by a um, consultancy in Spain. Again, some real challenges around project management. And the first project, uh, SAVES, that I just talked about, had a full-time project manager in the way that this project didn't. And we've encountered significant, I think, challenges as a result of how that's managed, how the consortium is managed and some of the challenging personal relationships that have resulted in actually there being some quite significant delays in terms of how the project is pulled together, which has impacted on how the, the project is going to work. So there's an overall summary. That this is taking genders and context, location and personal, and it starts to pick up on some of what I've talked about here. So with good deeds, the backdrop of public sector cuts and redundancies um, versus building on a very successful previous project with institutional buy-in, um, very challenging building stock in eTeacher where um, they've wanted to look at non-domestic and residential and they've been very ambitious with what they're trying to do and it's not quite gone as smoothly as I think they Hope. So there's a summary of the three projects. Just some final reflections and recommendations then. First of all, in reflecting on these projects from a lens of storytelling, I feel that as we write the fuller paper, that there's a richness coming out in terms of um, the reality behind the projects. Just simply presenting a 5% energy saving or no energy savings doesn't actually reflect really the story of the project at all and what's been successful or not about it. I think um, we need to think about what we mean by success. Is a project um, a standalone project or even if a project fails in terms of perhaps its energy savings, actually what part does it play in the future of that organisation or the researchers, do they then go on to do better research projects as a result of a failed project, uh, playing off two extremes there? But, um, you know, 
looking back in the long term, we may realise that that difficult project that didn't quite work as we hoped actually led on to much greater things, both for the organisation and for the researcher. Um, there's always going to be, I think, a really interesting challenge around lock-in of these funding applications and timelines of projects and the gap between what we say we will do and what in reality we can do. And really, finally, for me, does the focus on energy savings and heroes distract us from the real learning in these projects? And are we measuring the right things? What lies in between is often more interesting and relevant. So thank you. I'll just stop tour. Um, we'll be writing up more about this project, but all the um, papers are there for you to look at and follow up. And I look forward to talking to you about those projects um, and these learnings in the future. Thank you very much. Sorry, <laughs> lost control of Zoom there for a minute. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. That was um, really interesting. Um, so I'm going to continue to use moderator um, uh, privilege to ask a few questions that I thought of um, reading through your um, paper. So I am a fan of a narrative approach to particularly in presentations as um, anyone who saw my presentation on panel nine will tell you. Um, what do you think are the main advantages and maybe disadvantages of, of taking a sort of storytelling approach in presenting this kind of information? Yeah, it's, it's been interesting. It's very bizarre, by the way, just to watch your presentation back, to be watching yourself. Um, I was hoping that I would make it through okay. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I enjoyed doing it. I mean, I think the obvious thing for me is the whole issue of bias. You know what are we choosing to tell and not? And I, um, and, and I think, you know, we use the um, gender has the people, location, con context. I think are the three um, areas that they suggested in terms of the storytelling picks up. But I think as I was pulling the the reflections together, I was trying to give what's our framework for reflecting, so that it can't just be a series of random reflections about oh this person did this or remember when we did this so I think as I was doing it you know what's actually the, the framework and the question still that will guide that storytelling approach and um, so we started with we found the gender paper really helpful in that those three categories echo let's think about the people let's think about the location the context and I think when we develop it the paper further I think possibly thinking about other, other categories we might want to add to that. I don't think that's a fully comprehensive no. category. That's what they've started with, and I think we can build on that quite usefully. Okay. Um, we have a question from an attendee, Leah Ginther. I apologize if I mispronounced that, I almost certainly did. Can we embrace the learning opportunities of non-success, or do we still consider it too much as a failure of the project or personal failure? Yeah, well, I think that's a, a really important question. I think we've been we've been lucky with some of our projects that we had sort of quite a, a sequential dimension to some of these projects. We sort of got into a good routine where some of the projects we were doing were building on other ones. So um, I think the problem is when you have a discrete project in and of itself, it's that it's the it's the point of the end is sort of rethinking what we mean by success. So what's the time an individual project in terms of the good deeds project and launching this app what we said we would do the project was a failure it didn't happen we weren't able to do what we said we would do but actually you know we took all of that learning then into uh, the e-teacher project actually and I think the frustration of that project if some of you may be in Andrew's presentation yesterday where he was talking a little bit about this our job there was to um, be the social science partner in a more technical project and we wrote a really fantastic like 20,000 word summary of you know all the best practice around social science research and behavior change into app development and user engagement participatory approaches and um, you know they really didn't want to to do it the the app developer was going to develop his app over in Germany and it would be launched and rolled out and actually what do you do in these projects and consortiums where you're, the recommendations that you're given based on 
very good research and experience of 10 years to consider good actually no we're not going to do that very frustrating and then and then there's a challenge and that yeah we're still reflecting on how we um review that because that project is, is coming to an end in terms of its evaluation and it poses right. some challenge in terms of evaluating the yeah. success of that project uh, another question from sarah darby Richard, we've seen that the policy imperatives will increasingly include, stroke imply, stuff like your home heating has to change, forget about moving around in a big car and so on. So far, engagement programmes have usually been a lot more softly, softly, understandably. How do you see them evolving, ideally? Oh, it's a good question, Sarah. It's a good <laughs> question, that, isn't it? I think, uh, yeah, I was, I was actually I was thinking about this overnight in terms of this these projects. I think one of the challenges fundamentally we face is, um, oh, hold on, I'm lying, someone's just firing up a machine outside, hold on. I think, um, and this is a challenge for me, based on a lot of our research has been on individual behaviour change, and I think we need a bit of a critique over if all the messages that we're communicating are all about the individual consumer or the individual um, building user changing their behavior voluntarily. And I think that's, I think, the bigger issue we face with some of that, with those issues. And now I think we get into the role of policy and decision-making that's actually affecting those decisions. So do we really, should we be giving all this consumer choice to everyone and hoping that they will make the right decision at the end of the, in the end of the line where you, um, so I think that's the, Bigger question for me, yeah. reflection, Sarah, around that. We've got some other questions, but um, I think we better move on to the next present presentation and then come back and do that. We do have some extra time at the end because we've only got three presenting presenters in this slot. Struggling with the words today. All right, thank you very much, Richard. Thank you. So now we move on to our second presentation, like broken stick and no carrot. I think that's a brilliant title, um, presented by Andra Bloomberger, who has been a professor at the Institute of Energy Systems and Environment, Riga Technical University since 2001. Main research interests are the technical and policy aspects of energy efficiency, which he has worked on since 1992. Over to Andra, please. Hello, my name is Andra Bloomberger and uh, I work as a professor at Riga Technical University, Institute of Energy Systems and Environment. And today, on behalf of my two other colleagues, Ryan Saas and Dagne Bloomberg, I will present our latest study on energy efficiency in a public sector in Latvia. And we named our paper as uh, like a broken stick and no carrot, exposed analysis of public sector energy efficiency. Latvia's National Energy Efficiency Action Plan 2016-2020 was based on requirements of EU Directive on Energy Efficiency. And the National Cumulative Savings Goal set by 2020 was almost 10 terawatt hours. The national government decided to reach the goal by applying different policy measures namely energy efficiency obligation scheme, housing renovation, energy management in large uh, commercial energy consumers, voluntary agreements, uh, different transport policies, and energy management in public sector. The goal of this study was to evaluate the impact of this policy measure between 2016 and 2020. The methodology that we applied to reach the goal of the study first was the theory-based policy analysis, and then we mixed it with the EU guidelines on the evaluation of uh, policies called the Better Regulation Agenda. We used criteria from uh, this uh, guideline, and we added uh, institutional uh, capacity indicators from the literature review. The theory-based policy analysis uh, consists of six steps. First step is description of the policy measure. 
Second step is design of policy theory. Third step is change policy theory to indicators. Then it's followed by visualization of policy theory. Uh, after that, policy theory is checked and adjusted. And finally, analysis carried out and conclusions drawn. We used uh, the better regulation agenda criteria for uh, the step number three. And we used nine uh, criteria from uh, this agenda, namely effectiveness, efficiency, relevance, coherence, uh, value added, validity, equality, sustainability, and acceptability. And we added uh, three more indicators that we thought uh, will be important uh, to look on institutional capacity. And these are clear objectives and powers of the policy implementing body, namely Ministry of Economy in our case, the ability to balance and consolidate flexibility and continuity and degree of stakeholder involvement. Data collection uh, for analysis was carried out in two different ways. First, we uh, tried to gather uh, as much as possible quantitative data. And there were four sources used for uh, data collection. Unverified and unprocessed data about energy use of local governments from the energy efficiency monitoring system uh, available at the Ministry of Economy. Second, information available on the Ministry of Economy, Economics website. Uh, then information available on web pages of public bodies subjected to this policy measure. And finally, we searched different uh, pub publicly available information sources that we thought are related to this public, uh, policy measure. Qualitative data were gathered through uh, in-depth interviews, and we used uh, two different uh, groups of uh, uh, people who were interviewed. Uh, they were the key informants, and they, these were three energy consultants uh, who have a deep and long-term uh, knowledge about uh, public sector energy efficiency. And we also interviewed representatives, uh, uh, which are energy experts or project managers from regional planning offices, and then the and energy managers and project officers from uh, local governments. And we interviewed one researcher as well. These were uh, semi-structured uh, interviews that were later coded and used for further analysis. So now let's take a look closer on the policy measure itself. What is this? The energy efficiency law defines three groups uh, from the public uh, sector uh, who have a, a, an obligation uh, to introduce energy management system. First group is, are the largest cities and they are required or obliged to introduce a certified energy management system. The second group are municipalities with a development index of 0.5 or higher and the population uh, with more than 10,000 inhabitants. Uh, or in other words, we call them uh, the rich municipalities or the wealthy municipalities. And they have to implement an energy management system and they are not required to have a certified system, but just to implement the energy, energy management system. And the third group was state institutions uh, with a total heating area of more than 10,000 square meters. The, and they have the same requirements as uh, for the rich uh, municipalities. If you look closer on these three groups of uh, public uh, bodies, we see that uh, the, uh, the largest share belongs to uh, large cities uh, almost uh, 1,100 gigawatt hours or 78% from the total uh, consumption followed by the state institutions with 215 gigawatt hours or 15% and other local governments or rich municipalities uh, have a uh, 7% from the share. Uh, the, when the Minister of Economics was planning uh, to introduce this uh, policy measure, they planned 
to reach cumulative savings of 150 gigawatt hours from 2017 till 2020. And now let's take a look on the results. First, uh, we draw the theory based uh, policy analysis uh, and we uh, visualized uh, this uh, analysis. And here you can see uh, the graph. Uh, I will not go into details and for those who are interested more in, uh, in the details of uh, this uh, theory based analysis, uh, uh, you can take uh, a look, a closer look on our paper where we have discussed this part in more details. Uh, so what we've done here just uh, quickly, we uh, have uh, looked on cause impact relation or in other words, how the law requirements are introduced in the legislation, how they are related to different other policy instruments. Uh, indicators, and here is where the best regulation agenda indicators and institutional capacity indicators uh, come in. And then we look on success and failure factors uh, that, we, uh, uh, that we saw uh, during our analysis that uh, either lead to success or failure of the uh, policy measure. Uh, uh, reported savings uh, by the government uh, in 2016 were only 0.3 gigawatt hours, uh, while in 2017 it was a, a bit higher, 0.44 gigawatt hours, and uh, total cumulative savings uh, forecasted for 2020 was 3.28 uh, gigawatt hours which is only 2.2% of the target uh, that was 150 gigawatt hours is reached. Now let's take a look at uh, what happened and why we didn't reach the goal that was uh, planned or forecasted. And first of all, it is important to look on uh, numbers uh, by each of uh, uh, municipalities. And here what we can see that uh, subjected to this policy measure, there are a number of uh, municipalities, which uh, the, the dominant is Riga or the capital city. And then uh, there are uh, many more uh, smaller uh, municipalities. And uh, only a few of them have uh, introduced requirements of the law. And uh, there are some of the municipalities who have not introduced uh, uh, energy management system, and Riga is among uh, these uh, municipalities. So what were the success and failure factors? And we divided uh, these factors in two phases, the introduction phase of energy management system, and we uh, call it lack of carrot and stick or broken stick. Uh, and it was uh, that the initial assumption of uh, Minister of Economics was that energy management system will be introduced because public bodies are obliged to and they will benefit from uh, resulting energy savings. The ministry did not foresee any carrot, uh, which is uh, support from the state or any stick, which is defined saving goal or legal sanctions for non-compliance with the law. Uh, lack of uh, legal san uh, sanctions for non-compliance uh, has led to obligations uh, uh, ignored by six uh, local governments. And one of the reasons uh, that uh, we faced uh, during the interviews was the theme of uh, lack of social trust, uh, which is a characteristic for post-Soviet societies. Uh, and uh, there is a, a quote from an interview. It is still as in Soviet times, the government pretends to care. We pretend that we obey the law. Other reasons that we saw in uh, interviews uh, is uh, the le uh, level of support provided by co-workers and political leaders for energy efficiency. So if, if there was no support from the polit political leaders to energy efficiency, 
or support by co-workers, the energy, uh, energy management system was uh, not, not introduced uh, like in the case of uh, Riga municipality. In the majority of cases, energy management system were introduced as an activity within uh, projects, mainly EU funded. And uh, in some cases, the boundaries of energy management system are inter the application phase of energy management system, success and failure factors. Uh, there were uh, other factors. Uh, well, we see, saw that the degree of interest of political leaders and local government uh, energy managers uh, was the same as uh, in uh, implementation phase. Uh, we also saw that energy efficiency leaders is there, the, there is a leader or no, uh, or the kind of personality who is leading energy efficiency issues and the uh, municipality plays a very important uh, role. Uh, challenges to energy managers who do not have the capacity to be effective in the role, uh, or in other words, uh, uh, people who are just assigned uh, to deal with energy management as a part-time job, uh, usually did not succeed in uh, implementing energy management system. Uh, we also uh, saw that uh, there were energy groups uh, starting in uh, planning regions as an uh, exchange of experience uh, for uh, different energy managers in different municipalities. In the municipalities with certified energy management systems, uh, certifiers or auditors were forcing uh, to reach energy efficiency goals, which was a, a part of a success uh, uh, of implementation of energy efficiency. And the lack of communication between the Ministry of Economics and public bodies was uh, one of the failure uh, factors uh, uh, for not implementing energy management system. Also, lack of binding targets uh, was among uh, failure uh, factors. So let's come to conclusion. The objectives of the policy measure are aligned with society's current needs and challenges. The challenges associated with its implementation reduce the policy implementation rate. Only 2.2% of planned savings were achieved. And the number of reasons uh, we found, lack of legal sanctions, uh, low capacity of national supervisor body, lack of motivation and knowledge of local energy managers and management, lack of mandatory targets, the possibility of double counting for savings. Uh, however, this policy measure has enhanced public awareness of energy efficiency and added value via social pressure among municipalities. It is also likely that the effect of the measure is likely to continue beyond the policy end date. And we acknowledge uh, uh, Minister of Economics uh, for funding our uh, research. Thank you for attention. Great, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, we've got one quite sort of technical question. I'm not sure if it's going to be sensible to try and do this online or maybe it would be better to um, for you to respond in Hoover later but it was someone um, sorry Friedrich Seefeld has asked um, how the development index is defined yeah it's defined by the government uh, and I checked just on the internet while uh, the presentation was on and it uh, it can it's very complicated. Uh, there yeah. are eight uh, different indicators that are uh, kind of summed up with some weights and uh, given for each indicator. And just for example, it's about how many companies there are uh, per one thousand inhabitants in the municipality and what is the unemployment rate. Okay. And it's even the, maybe, the crime and the violence and so on. Oh gosh, uh, maybe if you could um, put the link to that page in the later on in yeah. Hoover for the session, then yeah. I could follow up. Um, <clears throat> so we've got another a question from Barbara Petalin Vishnevik, apologies again, um, about the achieved 2.2% energy savings. What kind of data are these energy savings based? Is this measured by the energy management systems or from the projects that have been implemented or, or how, how has that data been derived? 
Jā, bet vai jūs daidat from the National Energy Efficiency Monitoring System, but there was the problem that these data were not verified when we checked them, and because there is a lack of communication from the Ministry of Economics, we didn't have an access or we were not able to communicate with the ministry and interview people from the ministry, so we just used these data that they are basically reporting to uh, to uh, EU uh, Commission, so uh, so this was the how we gathered the data. Um, when you started the evaluation, did you know that the policy was this ineffective, or was it an unpleasant surprise? Yeah, honestly, because we have a, a project uh, where we had to evaluate all the policy uh, instruments applied by the government during this period. And uh, this is just one of the policy tools. And uh, uh, honestly, I, 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 I suspected that it's, it was not uh, as good as they expected, but I was uh, really, um, yeah, I thought it will be better, honestly. Um, so has the Ministry of Economy, the lead department, have they sort of, conceded that oh, we didn't do this very well oops you know or was it just like well we did what we said we were going to do tick that box let's move on kind of what what's there been their response to um, its failure yeah since we didn't talk to them uh, as i said uh, they didn't communicate uh, uh, and actually the irony is that they financed this project that's the irony of the whole. Yeah. They were ordering this uh, this kind of analysis, but they didn't, they didn't communicate with us because of some uh, reasons. Uh, so uh, I believe that they have still the same approach as I the described in the presentation that uh, we pretend that we we do what uh, what we need and uh, we obey the law, but in reality we just check the box basically. Yeah. So. Oh, Jessica's coming. <laughs> uh, given that we've got another, I think we've got time for one more question. Given that, given that the ministry were so sort of un, uninformative and uncommunicative, was it difficult to find people prepared to talk to you about the policy? No, no, no. And the municipalities, no. Okay, so they, yeah, that was all right. It was, it was in the central bit, and um, but presumably the. the were you able to, Riga didn't engage with this, presumably they weren't interested in talking to you about it. Yeah, but uh, since we uh, uh, talked to these um, energy consultants uh, mm -hmm. uh, and they they are not really engaged in uh, as any particular municipality and they have yeah. this kind of, they can see things from a side uh, then, uh, uh, then they were the ones who gave kind of objective picture of the whole story. And then because of Riga yeah. political situation, uh, uh, that was part of it. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Now, now I'll let Jessica in. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. It's good. We do, we do have a bit of time. I know that some people are moving between sessions, um, yeah, so we'll try to keep point. within that. But yeah, I think right. we have um, time. As, as we said, we only have three presentations in this um, in this session. So at the at the end, I think we've got some interesting discussion around conveying failure and bad news. Um, but I'd like to introduce our, our last speakers today. We have two speakers who I think have a have a positive story to share with us about real life learnings. Uh, our last speakers are Stella Ivanova, who is a project leader for the Federal Energy Efficiency Center in Germany, and Dominic Rao, who is a project manager for Prognos, one of the oldest economic research centers in Europe, where he has been working since 2016 in the Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Division. And they are going to talk to us today about their learnings from five years of monitoring the German market for energy efficiency services and the market-based approach towards energy efficiency. And we'll see uh, what they have learned. And, uh, and yes, their presentation is up. They're ready. Hi, everyone. Greetings from Germany. My name is Stella Ivanova, and I work for the Federal Energy Efficiency Center. I'm here today with Dominique Rao from Prognos, and we want to represent to you our learnings from the last five years of monitoring the German market for energy efficiency services. 
Um, shortly about my organization, we belong to the Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy. Our tasks are defined by the German Energy Efficiency Service Act, and our main goal is to support uh, the development of energy efficiency measures. Uh, to do so, we have to monitor the market for energy services, provide information and increase transparency in the market. Our main project is the market survey that we first conduct in 2016 and since then um, we're undertaking this uh, every year and we want to share our results with you. Uh, when we are talking about the energy efficiency services, what we mean by this, uh, we focus on three main categories with their corresponding services. This is energy management, contracting and energy audit and consultation. Shortly put, we are concentrating and monitoring only these services which aim at the efficient use of energy. How we do this, what method we apply and how our study is structured will be uh, presented to you from my colleague Dominic Rau. Dominic, please. Thank you. So my name is Dominic Rau from uh, Prognos AG and we are conducting this study for the last five years. Yeah, And we do this together with uh, EFO Institute and uh, Kantar. And uh, basically the study is um, uh, based on five sub studies, which is two supply side studies, uh, which is web based and telephone based and uh, three demand side studies for enterprises, private households and the public sector. In total, we had uh, 6,500 respondents last year and over 77,500 interview minutes uh, and as said, uh, for the last five years, so it's really a, a big study here. Um, we have um, basically a structure divided in, in two key elements, which is uh, at first statistical information for uh, industry, private households and the public sector, uh, which uh, shows us who we ask and on the other side, the, the key questions for energy efficiency services, uh, which uh, we are interested in. Uh, mainly here is the market volume, which we are uh, calculating based on the prices of products and service and the number of sales uh, for these products and services and also some uh, qualitative analysis um, concerning offering structure and demand structure. And um, to look into some basic results, uh, we have here the market volume. Um, uh, pay attention, please. There are two axes. Um, so on the right side, we have uh, the billion axis, uh, which is for energy contracting. The market here is around uh, between 7.7 uh, .7 and 8.2 billion euros uh, in the German market uh, for the last five years. Uh, and uh, follow it, followed by that, we have the energy consulting market uh, on the left axis, which is a million. Um, uh, there we have around uh, 390 to 490 million euros uh, per year in the last year. And uh, finally, energy management around 100 million, uh, short decline um, uh, to last year 88 million uh, euros per year. But um, uh, because we have this four year cycle of uh, obligatory energy management in Germany, uh, it may well be that next year the, the numbers are rising again. And uh, for energy management, there is also to say that uh, we are only focusing on a very clearly defined market of energy management. So maybe in the uh, wider definition, this market is way bigger and we are trying to uh, focus on that in the next uh, studies as well. Um, the main customer groups as seen by the supply side is for energy contracting, basically the real estate sector and also the public sector. Uh, for energy consult consulting, we have um, private households and other uh, commercial companies and also the real estate uh, sector. And for energy management, um, the, the by far the main customer is of course the energy intense industry and also other industry. Um, and um, yeah, on the third place, there's also commerce, um, no private households here, which is maybe no surprise. Um, as seen by the demand side, we have usage rates of uh, energy efficiency services here at first for the commercial sector. Um, so energy consultancy 
um, is the mainly used uh, energy efficiency service for the commercial sector uh, with around uh, 19 to 28 percent of usage in the last years. Uh, all of the others, so um, supply contracting, uh, management and efficiency contracting are behind that with efficiency contracting uh, on the last place in a, a short decline uh, in the last years. We will see how this develops in the next years. Uh, next on the public sector, uh, here we have energy consulting, um, where the demand is uh, by far the largest uh, with around 60%. Uh, which is around the sum of all the other three um, uh, items we are have here, so which is energy management contracting on, uh, and uh, performance certificates. Um, and uh, as the last slide here, I want to show you how uh, energy efficiency services are used by the private households. Uh, we see here the dark gray line which starts with a 34 uh, percent which is consulting for specific energy matters so basically energy consulting and uh, all the others are below but by far the highest answer is nothing uh, we did not use any efficiency service in the last years and uh, why this is the case and what to do about it um, will be shown by Ms. Ivanova now Thank you. So we asked uh, the private households why they're actually not interested in using energy consultancy services. And if we exclude the residents that are not planning any construction um, or renovation measures, the higher percentage by 45% um, that are not willing to actually take an advice on this matter uh, from from outside. Um, so they are not willing to 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 engage um, energy consultant and they are actually not seeing 38 percent the added value of such advice. It was not clear to them. So we can conclude that we have a problem here with the perception of energy services, uh, what their value are and why actually private households need eventually an energy service. Um, regarding um, in order to, to to take their construction and renovation work on going on. We asked them as well about the willingness to pay for consultant services. Uh, we see here the most interesting tendency from this graphic lies at the bottom. Uh, the two last lines are the willingness to pay more than 1000 euros. Um, so this is a challenge since the market price uh, for energy consultancies lies between 1000 and 1400 euros. So we clearly have a discrepancy here between what the customer is willing to pay and what uh, the supplier is offering. What we can do about it, we have so many subsidies for consultation services in private household for follow up measures uh, such as installation of a new heating system. They have a choice to, to use also tax deductions since 2020. Uh, we have also since the beginning of this year uh, introduced a national carbon pricing system in the heating and um, transport sector. So what actually is still missing is a suitable communication campaign um, that is uh, targeting the perception of, of energy services in private households. How uh, things are looking at in the commercial sector, it's a really similar picture here as well. Top reasons against using energy efficiency services is I can do it by myself. Planning and implementation can be done in-house. The first line, uh, more than half of those enterprises gave this answer over the years. Um, they are not seeing uh, energy services as economically viable solutions and uh, most most of them are um, perceiving it as too much effort for them. Um, as well, there is a lacking of incentive uh, on the price in the price area. Energy costs are perceived as low anyway. What we can do about it, what should we do about it? Uh, we, we should introduce effective incentives and the suitable price signals uh, and a carbon leakage scenarios should be considered. This all is set in motion or will be set in the next years in motion by the policy makers to tackle this challenge. What we here need uh, is still to get out information about why actually um, energy efficiency services are valuable to, should be valued uh, by enterprises, how they can actually help enterprises um, and in terms of energy efficiency and give some best practice examples. 
So we have also the public sector as an important actor since they have to fulfill um, their role model function in uh, the area of energy efficiency. Um, not surprisingly, most common barrier is an insufficient budget uh, named by one third of uh, the institutions that we surveyed. Uh, strong preference as well here for an in-house solution, uh, so to speak, plan and implement an energy efficiency measures without external help. Um, this is perceived as the more economical solution in contrast to external services. Lower energy costs here as well um, as a top reason and too much effort to use such services. It's fully understandable when the institution is understaffed and when you have a uh, big projects such as energy performance contracting or the implementation of energy management system. It requires personnel um, engagement over a long period of time. We can see this clearly in our next finding. We asked uh, public sector institutions if there is an established structure that is uh, solely focused on energy efficiency and uh, Ask them then about the usage of energy efficiency services as we see clear in the middle with energy management and energy contracting uh, the difference is by double um, we see if they 67 percent um, of the institution which have an established body solely accountable for energy efficiency is actually prone to use also the services so accountability and personal engagement are the most facilitating factor uh, in the public sector to use energy efficiency services. So what can we do here in this sector? We can add some funding, we can add some workforce. There is already a program for this. Um, the, the staff that is actually hired to do so, to, to um, elaborate concept for climate protection on energy efficiency should be widened and broadened and um, um, fulfilled with fulfilled with more more um more funding um and as well not to forget another uh, problem the perception of the services uh we sh we can meet this challenge by more information more uh, more best practice examples uh, to show the value added of energy efficiency services so a uh, short conclusion and outlook about the market development in Germany. In overall, we can say that in Germany, the market for energy efficiency services is mature and stable. We have no indication for shortages on the provider side. Um, we have uh, an optimistic view of, of the suppliers regarding the market development in the next three years. And we have strong investment that already been set in motion or will be set in motion by policymakers. So we're really excited to see how it all plays out in the next one or two years to see the see differences changes um, within the survey and maybe to present them again uh, with you thank you for your attention and uh, yeah we were happy to be here part of this event this year okay thank you very much Stella and Dominic uh, we have a few questions already coming in uh, so we'll get you to show your videos and to unmute and I can ask you these questions okay great so we first have a, a question from Barbara Petlin visiting and um, she asks are all consultation services for households market-based or what is the share approximately of the subsidy in the total amount of such consultations do you have an idea of this in your study no we actually differentiate only between uh, consultations that were free we have the number of free consultations, but uh, we cannot see, we ask the consultants what amount of their services are actually being done with subsidies, but no, this kind of number we cannot generate uh, to see households which are uh, done with consultancies uh, done with uh, subsidy or without subsidy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, oh, I think, uh, am I missing something? Yeah. We'll see if Dominic has more to add. Um, so I think overall you, you show that there's there's a market that's growing for energy efficiency services and we have positive stories there. And I think that there's also then um, an assumption that there is the value added for these different stakeholder groups that just needs to be communicated to them. Do you think that the value added though might depend on what type 
of energy efficiency services we're talking about and what type of stakeholder we have, because we had several stakeholders that you saw that said, we can do it ourselves. Um, is there a value added for all of the services to those that have the capacity to do it themselves? Um, my, my first answer will be every three of them has different barriers in uh, the, the, the perception area, uh, so to speak. Uh, we have consultancy, energy consultancy um, has difficulty because it's not um, a certified job, uh, like, like uh, the, the, the job title, it's new, there is no definition, it's not uh, being studied statistically, so uh, there is that. Um, and then you try to convince people uh, why they should do it and uh, what are the values from it, what are the advantages from it. Um, so that's the one. Contracting has uh, its own difficulties, um, is, especially by public bodies, it's perceived as, as something that we don't want to do and we don't it's something messy something we don't understand and um, it's uh, it's a it's a business model and they have issues with this uh, so this is the kind of perception uh, um, on which we have to work that's why a, an engaged personnel helps a lot um, helps to understand the, the business model and the technology behind it um, helps uh, activate people um, convince people because in the public sector to implement projects is a little bit more difficult than in enterprises um, so that will be my my answer okay thanks yeah. can just add um, yep dominic yeah, i can just add that also um, that, um, it's very different in each supply sector and very different in each uh, demand sector. So, uh, there are very specific measures um, to be taken. And then, um, so there is no single energy efficiency service mm -hmm. approach in total. Right. So the information might also need to be very targeted towards that so while, while the general finding is information actually this is quite complex <laughs> when you when you break it down mm. okay we have a, a clarification question also from barbara about what is meant by strong incentives in conclusions you talk about strong incentives um what do you mean by yeah. that um, we saw we saw that we have um we have two two monetary incentives so to speak we have uh since last year the option for private households that they can use tax deduction instead of subsidy which um maybe in germany is seen like the more suitable solution or more elegant solution there is not a lot of paperwork you can do it with your tax uh, submission so it's um it's an incentive to use the, the services um and we have also the um carbon pricing system uh, from the beginning of this year we see that as an um, incentive we can argue on the now on how strong this as an incentive is <laughs> but uh, it is it is uh, and more people are thinking about it um, maybe in private uh, households more than uh, in industry will change these price signal but uh, still it's gradually working and we are excited that's why to see uh, to see the results in the next studies so that's meant by incentives uh, we also um, there is um, as we spoke um, also about carbon leakage scenarios, there's also tackled by the policymakers. So there are a lot of topics that we should think about. Energy efficiency services is a cross-cutting issue. So there's many areas that are um, in, uh, involved as well. Yep. Um, and I mean, you're talking here with the incentives of the, of the role of, of government and policymakers. If we talk about this, information as well. Is that the role of, should the government be thinking about how to give better information about the value added propositions? Or is it on the energy efficiency providers themselves, do you think, who need to communicate better about their services? What do you think, who, who is responsible for, or who should be responsible for this better information that you, uh, you signal? I will say both of them. Uh, we see a government, if you want to foster something, you have to also explain it and not only to leave it leave it to, to itself and the market will take care of it. <laughs> there is uh, something that people find also some legitimizing power behind it um, so that can be used. Um, but the 
service providers have to think also about marketing their solutions. Uh, we clearly see that from the study. We didn't have the time to present this, um, these findings, but the courses, for example, we asked them which courses they took um, in the past three or five years, and there is always the technically focused and nothing about marketing. There was like last year, the first seminar on how should I approach my customer and how should I market my solution? And so uh, there is a, there is a definitely a need uh, there to, yeah, to, to, to explain maybe better to the customer what this is. We have also complex solutions here, so it's not that easy. Great, thank you. Yeah, it is it is complex, and I, I saw this as a as a positive story because you have a lot of uh, solutions here, but we also see challenges um, in, in your in your story as well to, in going forward. But exciting to see what's happening next. Um, so we have time now to open it up. Fiona, do you have an idea of what we should be discussing in this last part, or maybe some of our our uh, other speakers want to now unmute and put their videos on and see if there's anything between you that you found interesting, want to comment on or ask a question to your other speakers. We give you a chance now. <laughs> so um, I think just to kick things off, uh, there was some questions left for Richard. There was uh, a comment about the yeah. communicating failure. Yeah. And that, you know, this is hard to do in practice. Um, but I think all, all of you have something that didn't go quite right in the story um, and and how this is then communicated and who needs to hear this and how we how we do better in in telling the the failures any comments further on these how can we do better on telling the failures and make it more normal to talk about the failures richard you have a comment yeah what's well, we've been talking about this is a research team actually in the light of sort of i guess the last projects over recent years i think one of the important principles is that we can't make this personal, um, you know, because we're, we're dealing with, you know, other, other people and if within projects there are issues and challenges, I think it's really important to somehow depersonalize that. So, you know, we, we have to respect, obviously, ethics and personal behavior and we need, so it's like, what's the, what's the genuine learning here as opposed to two people fell out or someone was personally frustrated about a project? What's genuinely what's a constructive piece of learning here and I think that's the, the challenge that we face actually as we're talking and reflecting about our projects at the moment and I think that's uh, something that we need to be really careful of when we talk about these projects is that we don't we're not just publicly moaning or complaining about issues and certainly with the with the um, good deeds project and we did write about some of the the challenges in Leicester City Council at the time and I think we tried to be fairly open and frank whilst you know being respectful around anonymity and personalities and so on i think that's just the the really thin line to to tread i think yeah go dominic yeah so i also have a question for you richard um so um in this uh, public screen for students homes um they're they're shown to everybody how much energy they are being consumed. Um, and I, my question is, was this goal of saving energy actually shared by everyone? Or uh, are there groups of uh, homes maybe uh, who use the screen and go in the opposite direction because that everyone shares this perspective that we have and uh, always that you have this positive outcome? Yeah, well, you, you cut out a little bit there, but I think you're talking about what were people consenting to sort of sharing their energy publicly in sort of domestic context? Is that was that the question? Not about sharing the data, sharing the vision. I think it's I think it's your um your microphone when your hands are <laughs> expressing too. It might be moving. Um, but is it about the shared vision? Did everyone share the vision or the goal towards the energy savings? Yeah, I think that's a I mean, that's a really interesting question about how these projects are formulated and who consents to being involved in them. So we certainly had that in um, in Leicester the Council, you know, they, you know, through the relationships, they agreed to this um, organization being part of the research. And then we're having to approach the people separately. And now broadly speaking, that organization was very important. I don't think we encountered so many issues. I think with the current project where 
you know, someone's uh, local authorities made a decision that that this school might be involved, and then actually there are negotiations to be had with the with the with the head teacher or the 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 teachers and so on about them. Hang on a minute, we, did we sign up to this or not? And I think, you know, they're carefully negotiated um, relationships, and I think they they haven't in this particular project always worked out as well as they could do. And there have been some tensions in some of those relationships. And um, and similarly in some of the residential flats that they're going into, yeah, it's not been quite clear for us how that consent was negotiated. So I think that's a really important point. I think the setup of these research projects is really important. And I think that's what's sometimes missed is that, you know, we're, academics are often under so much pressure to write these bids and to work on them. It, it's how do we write in that reflexivity time? And that goes back to the, the Leicester project. Why? Because it was a digital economy project. We had to say that we developed some kind of app and six months in, we realized that actually they were so far, they were really not very technically savvy at all, the people we're working with, but they were really valuing working together and talking about energy. And that was where the learning and interesting thing was happening. But what we've said to the funders, we need to develop an app. So we've got to develop something. So I think that I'm aware at the moment, I'm involved in a couple of EU projects at the moment that are being written and trying to write in that reflexivity and openness at the start. So we're not committing to, to too much at the start, but of course that's what the funding bodies want to see. So I think that's a real challenge there for how we manage and organize these research projects. So sort of on that, and sorry, but unless anyone else wants to jump in on that theme, Andrew, your the the policy that you evaluated was almost the, the completely the wrong end of that spectrum in that it was something that the Ministry of Economy just said of a sort of shopping list of things that they could do to meet their targets, oh, we'll take that one. And then they just completely imposed it on the local authorities and some of the public bodies and said, right, you're going to do that, you know, off you go. And, and that meant that there were a few places that either had engaged people who were already, this was like, ah, oh, my opportunity to do something. I finally got like a mandate to do it, or they happened to have other projects that were going on and they could build on that. Is that that's sort of the impression I've got. I'm sorry, I, I'm I'm answering for you, which I shouldn't do. Please talk about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's uh, goes well what uh, Richard told about this positivist approach that you only tell positive stories, you don't tell negative stories. Uh, I believe that you have to tell both stories, not just the positive. And the negative story has uh, its positive side, I would say as well, that uh, uh, what I wanted to tell that not that uh, Latvians are losers, but uh, I just wanted to tell the story that if there are some EU uh, uh, regulations or directives just uh, coming down at the top down to the national governments, and if the capacity of the servants, public servants are low, so what they basically do, as Fionn just told, that you just take it and, and put it somewhere, like, okay, no, okay, the EU director says, okay, you need energy efficiency obligation scheme. Okay, we just take it and we uh, put it somewhere on the elect electricity utilities in some way. And, and copy paste basically. You don't use these local contexts. You don't understand how people think and behave. And uh, so what comes out is what I uh, just presented. And uh, and the pity is that uh, whatever policy tool we take, either in public sector, or commercial sector, or energy efficiency obligations, him, we unfortunately we have to tell this bad uh, sad story or negative story in each of these sectors and it's nothing to do with people in these sectors they, they are good people there but uh, but this kind of uh, public uh, policy makers that's uh, where we see the major problem is this institutional capacity who are these people why they behave like that and there are some uh, hidden things that uh, are not even mentioned uh, officially but we have a very tough uh, uh, lobby of uh, natural gas, Russian gas, and they have all these people uh, within all the public institutions. They do their the great work or dark work 
uh, being uh, opposed to any energy efficiency uh, policy. So this is what I didn't tell you and uh, what is behind it, but uh, that's the truth. So basically I saw yesterday a very nice presentation uh, on hard to reach consumers that was an, uh, from, the, from, uh, from the UK. And I think that uh, if I was asked who are the hard to reach uh, uh, audience in energy efficiency in, in Latvia, I would say these are the public policy makers that uh, are hard to reach and, uh, and uh, to just to tell them uh, what is going on and, uh, and what they should do better. And the good, there is one good message as well that uh, the, these people who did uh, this first wave of energy efficiency action plan by 2020, most of them have left the ministry and we have a new uh, servants, public servants now coming in a new wave. And, uh, but it's again about the lobby of Russian gas comes in. Is it still alive? How they will behave? So there are all these different layers of, uh, of um, pol energy efficiency policies. I, energy efficiency is hard enough without someone actively yes. lobbying yes. against you. I mean, that's just, yes. that's just so, oh, I can't get over that. I mean, I, I, mean, I suppose, you know, certainly um, the utilities in lots of countries, including the UK, and, and I sort of get that impression in the US, do, there's a little bit of pushback is just like, well, you know, you're asking us, to, to spend time and money persuading people to buy less of our product, you know, what's that about? But but normally they understand that in the long run, this, this has to happen, but to have somebody who really doesn't care about that, who is actively saying, no, use the energy, it's great. You know, that would just, wow. <laughs> and it's fossil energy. It's not just energy. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's the worst, you know, we're trying to get out of uh yeah sorry just no I'm, I'm also um commenting when i when we're talking about the the failures and the and the need to talk about them i think that there's also the the way that we talk and communicate about them what i liked uh stella when you when you boil it down very very easily like, yes we can have market-based instruments but if we don't tell anybody about them then they're not going to work by themselves like the this assumption about things and being very very short and concrete, I think, in, in what we're seeing. So I think, um, Richard, you talked about also academics and how we communicate. We tend to put our, our findings in a flurry of long paragraphs. And I think sometimes we don't see it how it is enough. I wonder if others also find this, that not only seeing the bad stuff as well as the positive stuff, but also just being pretty blunt, I think. Um, and, and as Fiona, as you're pointing out, we're at the point now where maybe the bluntness is also called for more, um, not only the, the full picture, but a very um, blunt picture. Um, I wonder if anyone else has comments on this. This is difficult too. Um, Stella, you're the one that boiled down. Have you, have you also like given these kind of messages that you gave in at the end of your talk back to policymakers? Or how do you find the way you must frame your findings? Um, we have an established bureaucratic way about it. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we talk about it. Um, the center is actually binded to the ministry and uh, we are supposed to help. We are helping in developing measures or making suggestions based on findings. So we have also a way uh, every year or two, uh, we make also suggestions about measures and uh, so on, and we are free to, to choose and to just to put it uh, in short in short words, um, also to think about it, uh, how to pay about it, who is addressed to. So it's really concrete. It's, 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 not, a, it's, it's not academic about it. It's just, I want to do this, two, three uh, um, sentences about it, and then to just the key hard facts, who is paying, who is addressed, and what we'll do to others, or how is it binded, uh, how is it uh, influencing other incentives or other subsidies, other, pro, um, other projects, and so on. So we there, there is a way about it. it it's still, it's still just um, you're just a voice, so it can be heard or not. That's depending on the situation. <laughs> yeah, but it sounds like there's an appreciation of having the the 
messages clearly for for the different audiences yeah i think it's also different on whose failure where we're communicating about i think it's hard when it's our own um and it's reflexive um then then it can be maybe hard to to be that way when it's about others maybe it's easier <laughs> too any other thoughts here before we're wrapping up thanks stella for that insight too <laughs> Okay, then I think we, uh, Fiona, did you? <laughs> okay, then we will just let you know that. Uh, so we have a extra 10 minutes here to our, to our break between paper sessions. Uh, we do have uh, two more parallel sessions coming up and then later on in the afternoon, um, there will be, uh, what, what do we have here? Sessions, informal sessions. So two sessions. Uh, at 4.15, I believe, uh, the European time, both in meeting modes, so you can switch cameras on and have discussions. Um, and one is an exploration of how sound and visualization can lead to renewed connection to the energy system. Um, again, we are talking about narratives here <laughs> also, but I think we can we can add to those narratives. Um, why not? So uh, an informal session about this. And the other looking at urban net zero and renewable energy commitments during COVID-19. Uh, yes. And then uh, to be very informal, at 6 p.m. European time, there will be a summer study party. So we check the agenda in Whova and make sure that you're, you're leaving some time for also the fun stuff after we're, we're thinking and discussing here in the next two parallel sessions. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, we have also another uh, monitoring and evaluation panel or yeah, a parallel session later on this afternoon. So we might see many of you back yeah. then. Thank you, everybody, very much. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.